All right. We are looking from uh, John 16. We're going to read from verse 23, and we're going to read into chapter 17 and verse 5. And both these sections are going to have a common theme. And the common theme is prayer to the Father. And we're going to observe in verse 23 to 33 that the disciples are now told that they have this great privilege of being able to ask the Father, to speak directly to the Father. And then in chapter 17, the Lord Jesus speaks to his Father. So really, that's the, the wonderful thing. Prayer to the Father, the great theme of this section. So verse 23 it says, and in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name, and ask and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father, and am come into the world. Again I leave the world, and go to the Father. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own and shall leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that thou, they might know thee, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee, before the world was. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this evening. I think one of the things that we've been observing is that as we've looked at the Gospel of John, 12 chapters, 1 through 12, have really taken, been taken up with pretty much three and a half years of the public ministry of the Lord Jesus. But in the section we're in now, chapters 13 through 17, Five chapters take up one evening. <laughs> and so you get the sense of how important this one evening is and the information that's being conveyed. And we've said in many ways it's prep school. Uh, it's the Lord Jesus preparing them for his imminent absence. He's going to the cross. He's going to the tomb. He's going from there to the Father's right hand. And he's trying to prepare them for his absence, telling them some of the things that will happen, uh, the world's hatred, telling them about the comforter that will come, uh, telling them about the fact that the comforter will bring things to their remembrance. So there's just a, a lot of information that he has been conveying to them, very important information, preparing their hearts for what is to come so that they're not in shock and they're not panicking in any way and that they'll know that he is who he claimed to be because all of these things he has told them ahead of time, things that are going to happen. So we'll notice in verse 23, it says, in that day she'll ask me nothing. Now, again, I think it's important that just so we get the connection with what had gone before uh, in the previous study, uh, he has just talked to them about the 
uh, the roller coaster experience that they were going to go through, uh, the sadness, the sorrow uh, at his uh, crucifixion, uh, followed by the joy that resurrection morning. And so if we just back up a little bit, just to get the context, in verse 21, he says, a woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for the joy uh, that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again and your heart shall rejoice and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day, you shall ask me nothing. In other words, in that day of their joy, in a sense, a lot of their questions are going to be answered. Uh, all this talk about the little while you're going to see me and then a little while you're not going to see and all this, all of that's going to be answered when he comes back from the grave, when they're there. Uh, and he said, you know, he talks about speaking to them in parables. Uh, he's just use this kind of simile of a woman in travail giving birth and and how quickly she forgets the the travail of childbirth because a man's born into the world and so this is the picture that he is telling them that that in a, in many ways all, a lot of their questions a lot of the things that they've been asking now about this a little while all of these things are going to be clearly answered when he's risen from the dead. It's going to make perfect sense to them. It's like uh, everything's going to fall into place. Uh, everything will make sense. The penny will drop, as we often say, when that happens. So it says, in that day, you shall ask me nothing, because it's just like everything will become crystal clear to them uh, in uh, his resurrection uh, appearances. It will make sense to them, all that he has spoken to them up to now. And then he follows that, and he says, verily, verily, I say unto you, whatever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Now, I want to point out just the, the phrase ask or the word ask. You'll, you'll notice that it, it's in verse 23. Uh, we've got it twice. Uh, that day you shall ask me nothing. Again, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Verse 24, hitherto, if you ask nothing in my name, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. Verse 26, that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not to you that I will pray the Father for you. Now, obviously, it's a big feature of this section. And there's, that word ask can be used in two different ways. It can, can be used in this way, ask as in asking a question. In other words, uh, asking, uh, as, and that's how it's used uh, in verse 23. In that day, you shall ask me nothing because your questions are going to be answered. But there's another way that we use the word ask, and that is asking a favor, right? Asking a question, asking a favor. We, we, in our language, we use it that way, right? Sometimes we use, I'm asking you something. I'm asking you a question. Another way I could use it is I'm asking a favor uh, from you. And so it's used in both ways in this chapter. And even in this verse, in verse 23, in that day, you shall ask me nothing. In other words, you won't be asking questions in that day because it will make perfect sense to you, everything that I've said to you up to this point. But then he goes on and says, verily, verily, I say to you, whatever you shall ask, as in terms of a favor, that this is a prayer request, we might say, it says, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. And so he's revealing to them this, this incredible privilege that is going to be theirs, that they will be able to ask the Father for anything in his name. Now, again, we've got to remember, now this is not a group of people asking because they're, they're wanting the, Amer uh, the American dream or the Canadian dream. So it's not like, um, you know, Lord, I really think it would be wonderful if you could give me a nice Ferrari. That's, you know, that's not the thought here because don't forget these men have left everything to follow him. And the whole context here is they're going to be his witnesses of his resurrection in a hostile world. So this is not asking with a, a covetous idea of, I, I want all this stuff. That's not in view at all. It, it, the idea is this, uh, he's telling them that he's going away, but they are going to become witnesses of his resurrection and in a, in a hostile environment. 
And so in that kind of context, they can ask things in the, uh, in, in the asking the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus, in his authority, as it were, also with his interest in view. And he says, he will give it you. And that's a promise. But again, it's connected to the witness and the work that they have been called to do. It's not just a free shopping list of anything you want uh, to make you happy in this world. It really is in connection with the, the work and the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I was, uh, my wife and I are reading a very interesting book at the moment on prayer together. We, uh, we like to do that occasionally. And so we read a chapter and then talk about it. And this book is called The Prayer Factor. Uh, and it was about a, by a man who was a missionary uh, in Eastern Europe uh, in years gone by and particularly behind the Iron Curtain. And he talked about being in Romania and uh, the, the amazing revivals that occurred in Romania during the communist regime. And he said part of the reason was that the people of Romania knew how to lay hold of God in prayer. And they were praying and they were praying for God to prepare the hearts of the unbelievers in a very specific way for the gospel campaign that he was going to hold, Sami Tippett, there uh, in Romania. And as they were praying, uh, they, they gave one illustration of how the Lord answered their, their prayers. They're asking the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so here's an, a, one of the most wonderful stories, really. But there was a, there was a man, he was a, a manager of a factory, and he came home from work. He was a communist card carrying the whole thing. But he came home from work and he had this incredible sense that he needed to get uh, cleaned up from work, get shaved, get dressed because he was to go somewhere. But he, he had no idea where, but he just had this, oh, well, I need to go home, get dressed, get shaved, get ready. And so here he was sat in his home, no idea what's going to happen. And one of the believers was exercised to invite him to the gospel campaign. He went and knocked on his door, said, will you come and hear this speaker from America? And he said, oh, sure. That's why I'm dressed. I, I knew there was something. And he went there, heard the gospel and was gloriously saved. And he said, you could multiply those kind of stories because the people knew how to ask the father in Christ's name in connection to his honor, to his work, uh, to, to the saving of souls, and amazing things resulted. And so he tells us, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name, ask and you shall receive, then notice this, that your joy may be full. Can you imagine how joyful that man who had been praying about inviting this this guy from work would have been when he went along to that meeting and got saved. Do you think his joy would have been pretty overflowing? I think the guy would have been fit to burst. He'd be so joyful. Right. And so this is the kind of experience that the Lord wants us to enjoy uh, our, our fullness of joy, because we're asking for things of the father in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's to do with witness and work and, and the, the claims of Christ in this world. And one of the results of the, the answer to these prayers from the Father is this overflowing fullness of joy, that your joy may be full. Then he says, these things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, just like he was talking that little simile up there about the woman in travail. And he says, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak to you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. So again, has in view his post-resurrection ministry. And again, they'll be so ready. Everything will, uh, they'll be prepared. They'll be ready to receive everything that he has to share with them during that post-resurrection ministry. And uh, now there's, a, there's still a lot of confusion in their minds. They've, uh, again, they're getting a lot of information. There's a lot of things that are not clear to them. And again, sometimes the Lord would use these uh, pictures, these similes, these proverbs that they found hard to grasp. He says again in verse 26, at that day you shall ask in my name, and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. 
I just love this verse. What he's saying is, when you, in that coming day, when you ask in my name, I won't have to, if I can put it in a kind of common English, I won't have to twist the father's arm to get him to pay attention to you or to listen to your request. And so let's just notice it in the context of the next verse. So at that day, you shall ask in my name, and I say not to you that I will pray the Father for you. In other words, I don't, I don't have to kind of get the Father to do this because notice the connecting word verse in verse 27, for. It was, uh, <clears throat> it, I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you. In other words, you can come into the Father's presence because the Father loves you. Now, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? I remember, I think I've mentioned this before, but I did a study. Uh, we were going through the upper room ministry. Uh, it was a men's study. And this verse, men, a, a few of the men began to weep. And one of the things that they said was, their human father never, ever once in their remembrance ever said to them, I love you. And when they, re they realized this scripture, the father himself loveth you, it was just overwhelming for them. They could hardly cope with the idea that there's the father in heaven loves them. And why? Why does the Father himself loveth you? So that you can come and ask things from him because he loves you. Why does he love you? It says, because ye have loved me and have believed that I came from God. And again, I want to just try and put this in a rightful context here. When the Lord Jesus was here during those three and a half years, we know that he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We know that he was despised and rejected of men. And the Father in heaven watched this, watched the hostility, the hatred, the disdain, the mockery that was directed at his son. And yet in this little group of men that were in this upper room that he was talking to, these men loved the Lord Jesus. They believed him. They believed what he said. And the father is just so delighted <laughs> that here are a few men that actually love my son in a world where the overwhelming opinion is we will not have this man. <laughs> we hate this man. And yet here is affection and love shown to his son and the Father loves them <laughs> because you've loved me. And I think that I was thinking of this this morning as we just a small company because we've been affected by uh, the Delta variant. So we were very small this morning as we met to remember the Lord. But I just thought in this scene, which hasn't changed since the days that the Lord Jesus was on earth, vast majority still hate the Lord Jesus. No time for him. And here we were, a small company, telling the Father how much we appreciate the person and work of his son. And I believe the Father found great delight in that. And so that's the, that's the sentiment that this verse is telling us, that, that the Lord doesn't have to twist the Father's arm for him to answer our prayers, because the Father loves us. He loves you. Isn't that wonderful? He loves you. And he, 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 him, the Father himself loveth you because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father and I'm coming to the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. And again, this, this teaching that the Lord Jesus has repeated over and over and over again in the Gospel of John, was that he was the one that had come down from heaven. And it was this teaching that had caused such hostility from the religious hierarchy, because they would say, well, this is, this is Joseph's son. Uh, yeah, th even 
questioning the legitimacy of his birth, all of these things, they would, they would emphasize those things and they, they couldn't accept his claims that he was the one that came down. And just to remind us of this emphasis in John's gospel that has been all the way through that he was the one uh, that had come from the father. Uh, John 1.14, the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And so this idea of the word made flesh dwelling among us, coming uh, from the father, uh, the word that was with God and was God. Uh, John 3.31. He that cometh from, a, from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. Again, speaking clearly of the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 6, that controversial sermon that caused many, even those that were uh, so-called disciples, to go there away uh, from him and abandon him. And why was it? What was the big emphasis? Verse 50, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. John six fifty one. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. The bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And so over and over again in the Gospel of John, we've seen this emphasis that the Lord Jesus has given, that he is the one who came down from heaven. He's that eternal son who was in the bosom of the father, who has now come down and manifested the father to us. And that was the, the kind of flashpoint. They hated his claim. They thought it was a blasphemous claim that he came down from heaven. And so he says again, uh, you believe that I came out from God. I came forth from the father and come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the father. His disciples said to him, lo, now speakest thou plainly and speakest no proverb. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things and needest not that any man should ask thee, by this we believe that thou camest forth from God. So again, they're reaffirming. We do believe that you're the, the Lord from heaven. We believe that. And what again, a great confession. But the Lord says to them, verse 31, Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Because he knew that they, they were still they were still a little bit shaky <laughs> and there was still going to be a lot of disappointments. It wasn't just Peter who was going to deny the Lord, but all of them were going to at least forsake him for a while. And so he says, behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come. In other words, this very evening, <laughs> this very night, very soon, actually, he says that you shall be scattered every man to his own. And shall leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone. Because the father is with me. And we're reminded. Of the. Scripture that we studied. When we studied Zechariah. That is going to be the response. Of the disciples. Zechariah 13 and verse 7. <clears throat> it says. Awake O sword against my shepherd. And against the man that is my fellow. Saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. Strike the shepherd, the sheep shall be scattered. And that's, again, quoted a couple of times. It's quoted in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26, again, of this very uh, thing the Lord is speaking of, the fact that they would all be scattered and leave him. Verse 31 of Matthew 26, Then saith Jesus unto them, all ye shall be offended because of me thus this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. And again, Mark's gospel, chapter 14, Mark 14 and verse 27, same idea conveyed. Mark 14, verse 27, Jesus saith unto them, all you shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I'll smite the shepherd, the sheep shall be scattered. And so <clears throat> very clearly, 
the Lord is, even though they've made, again, this confession that they do believe, but there, there's still going to be some disappointments, uh, some frailty is going to be seen in the disciples. And so he says, the hour come of the aid now is now come, that you shall be scattered, every man to his own, shall leave me alone. Yet he wants to assure them that he's not alone because the Father is with me. And he will know that love of the Father, that communion with the Father, even though they all are going to abandon him. He says, these things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Remember, again, he is going through, uh, he's going to Gethsemane. His soul's going to be deeply troubled. But he has already said, peace I give to you, my peace I give unto you. That even in the midst of the turmoil and the tumults of the days ahead, they will know his peace. And it is amazing that the peace that he offers isn't connected always to peaceful circumstances. Another uh, book my wife and I have been reading is about Christians in the Middle East, and uh, it's called Killing Christians. And uh, many of these young believers uh, end up being martyred for their faith. And it's amazing the incredible peace and tranquility they have in the midst of the deepest trials, including beatings and all of these things. And uh, again, it's just a challenge to recognize that the Lord can give his peace. And that peace is not necessarily connected to the most peaceful circumstances. It can be a peace in the midst of what seems to be the most, the greatest turmoil. And so he says, these things have spoken to you that in me you might have peace. And again, his words, things that he's spoken to us, are what gives peace in trouble and trial. The very words of the Lord Jesus bring peace to a soul. And uh, one of the things that has been interesting to me, as I'm going to be doing some preaching uh, in the First Thessalonians in a uh, at a coming conference, and uh, one of the things that's interesting is that in the in uh, in Iran and Iraq, one of the most popular books to memorize is First Thessalonians because it talks about joy in the midst of affliction <laughs> and trial. And to them, it's real. They're living like the Thessalonian church. And they and so that, that just book is alive to them. And so again, we can have that peace. And it's his words that bring peace to our souls, even in the midst of deepest trials. These things I've spoken to you, that in me, you might have peace. In the world, ye shall have tribulation. Again, we, we're assured of that. Those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution or tribulation. It's just, it's a guarantee. And so in the world, you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I am the victor over the world. That's the idea of the overcomer. It's, it's the idea of the victor, the, the one who is victorious I have overcome the world. Now look with me, please, as the Apostle John had meditated, I am sure, much on that scripture. And in 1 John chapter 5, we read these beautiful words. 1 John 5, verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. And so the real overcomer in the word of God is the person that believes that the Lord Jesus is the Son of God, that is born of God, supernaturally born of God, and as a result of that can enter into Christ's victory. He says, I have overcome the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Our confidence in him can give us great victory over the world. So we've looked at this section and we've emphasized the fact that one of the great privileges of the believer, the child of God, is that we can ask the father 
in the name of the Lord Jesus, and he will give it to us. And we can come with confidence into his presence because the Father loves us. And the reason the Father loves us is because we love the Lord Jesus and we have believed him. <laughs> and so we can have access to his presence and avail. And we need to, and we need to do it frequently, and we need to do it. And he, he tells us that if we want real joy in our lives, fullness of joy, one of the ways we experience fullness of joy is seeing prayers answered, asked of the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus. And maybe we're not as joyful as we ought to be because we're not availing of this great privilege of asking the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so now we move into this, what many consider to be almost the Holy of Holies, this chapter, the high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we are going to consider this, I want to just kind of give a little outline to begin with. In verses 1 through 5, the Lord Jesus, as he speaks to his father, he is praying for himself. So it's, he's asking the father to glorify him with the glory he had with the father before the world was. So it's, it's a personal request that he is asking the father for himself. In verse 6 through 19, he is praying for his disciples. And when I mention the disciples, I mean the immediate disciples, those men that have accompanied him, that have been with him in the upper room, that are actually listening to him pray. He's praying for his disciples. And then from verse 20 to the end of the chapter, he is going to be praying for his church. Those who will believe on the testimony of these men, the church age saints. So three aspects of the prayer of the Lord Jesus to his father. It's very interesting to me that the upper room discourse begins with the Lord looking down and laying his hands on the dusty, dirty feet of the disciples. That's how this discourse began. He's looking down. He's looking at their dirty feet. He's laying his hands on them. He's washing them. It ends by lifting up his eyes to heaven and laying his hands upon the Father's throne. <laughs> and so it's kind of a, an amazing thing. We, we, we have uh, his humility, and now we have the exaltation of Christ speaking to the Father and laying hold on the Father's throne. So just a beautiful contrast. And I think it's very important for us just to remind ourselves that in, in the Gospels, there are 15 instances recorded for us of our Lord Jesus praying in the four Gospels. 11 of them are in the Gospel of Luke. Now, that shouldn't surprise us because Luke is that Gospel that portrays the Lord Jesus as the perfect man, the dependent man, um, the uh, <clears throat> yeah, the, the man par excellence, if you like, and the man who is dependent on his father. So great emphasis in Luke's gospel on the prayer life of the Lord Jesus. The, the records also tell us that he spent whole nights in prayer. Uh, we have it in, for instance, Luke's gospel, chapter 6 and verse 12. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. We also have a parallel in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 23. Matthew 14, verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. And so again, a couple of examples where the Lord Jesus spends the night in prayer. In Luke, we said he prays as the dependent man. But in John, he prays as the son with the father. And it's really deity speaking to deity. 
it, it's uh, I find it amazing as I think about this chapter. It's it's almost as if the Lord is allowing the disciples and us because of John moved by the Holy Spirit recording this, but we're actually getting in to listen to God the Son speaking to God the Father, and we get to eavesdrop on that conversation. <laughs> and I find that quite remarkable, that, that the disciples could listen in, and we're able tonight to listen in and to, to as it were, just to, to consider what the Son, the Eternal Son, said to his Eternal Father. And also, <clears throat> notice that, in, for instance, uh, how he prays here, uh, Verse 24, for instance, he says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. And so <clears throat> when we pray, we don't say I will. We say your will, <laughs> right? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But he says, I will. Again, showing uh, that, again, it's deity speaking to deity, indicate inequality, a term which no disciple could use. Up to now, he's been talking to his disciples about his father. He's been telling them about the father's house. He's been telling them about the father's love. Uh, he's been telling them that they can ask things of the father. So he's been speaking to the disciples about the father. And in this chapter, he is going to speak to the father about the disciples from verse 6 through 19. And they get to listen into that. And so it's a, a, a really may, many feel this chapter is an anticipatory illustration of his present work in heaven for us now. Just as he was speaking to the father about his disciples here in this instant, right now, he ever lives to make intercession for us. And he is there as our high priest and as our advocate in the very presence of God for us. And so what a wonderful thing it is. And so we have this privilege of listening in and hearing the son open his heart to his father. So it says, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven. Some have suggested very eloquently the heavenly gaze he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. <clears throat> so he is asking the father to glorify the son, but at the same time that the son is glorified, the father is glorified. Now, I want to just remind us in chapter 16 and verse 14, notice it says, he shall glorify me. That's the Holy Spirit will glorify the son. And here we have the father being asked to glorify the son and the son also glorifying the father. And so you get this idea that within the Godhead, there's this mutual glorifying of each other. And of course, for you and I, what is our reason to exist? Why, do, why are we here on earth? Well, to glorify him, right? That's why we were created. We are created for the express purpose of glorifying God. And uh, whatever we do, Paul would say to the Corinthians, whether we eat or drink, we're to do it all to the glory of God. And so it should really grip us. But he wants to be glorified for the express purpose that it in turn will glorify the Father. And so I guess we could say that one of the greatest motivations in Scripture is the glory of God. It really is. It's a massive topic. Uh, Psalm 115, a verse that I'm sure uh, we know well, but it's a, a, a delightful verse. It says, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. That our desire is that all glory should go to his name. 
not to us. To God be the glory, great things he has done. It should be always to him. So whatever we do should be for his glory. And yet the, the son asking that he might be glorified. That's an amazing statement in itself because we read in Isaiah's prophecy that God is jealous of his glory and will not share it with anyone. And yet the son says, Father, glorify me. <laughs> so again, it is another one of these proofs of the deity of Christ that, that he would ask to be glorified, knowing that if the son is glorified, it would also glorify the father. And of course, it's, it has in view the glory of the cross. The son would be indeed glorified uh, by his work on the cross. And that would also in turn glorify the father, make him look good because it reveals all of the father's attributes, his holiness, his justice, his righteousness, his mercy, his grace, everything is seen at the cross. And so the, the, the cross work of the Lord Jesus is that place where the son is glorified and where the father is glorified in every sense of the word. And so he says, father, the hour is come, glorify thy son. And then he says, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Now, I'm going to think about this for a moment, because there are some people that say that before the world was, the father had decided that he would give so many uh, who were the elect ones to the son. And they were going to get saved and no more, no less. It was like this deal done before the world began. And they would quote verses like this. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. As if it's some limited number that's in view that he has been given. Now, again, I want us to look because context is absolutely crucial to understanding the word of God. And this phrase thou hast given him, has, is used several times in this passage, and it's quite clearly referring specifically to the disciples who are listening into this prayer. Let me prove it to you. Verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Verse 12, while I was in with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So you get what we're saying here in the context. The, the ones that the father had given to the son were the twelve. That's who they were. This is not some eternal package deal before the world began. But the, the, these disciples were already, most of them were already John's disciples before they became the Lord Jesus' disciples. And they were what we would call Old Testament saints. Okay, that's what they were, old, what we would call Old Testament saints. And these Old Testament saints, the Father had given them to the Son. And it says, thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Okay, so this is these individuals, except verse 12, the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And then he says, defining what he means by eternal life. This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou has sent. So we've tried to stress that throughout this, that sometimes when we, even when we preach the gospel, we almost give the impression that eternal life is, is a duration of time. And it means you're going to live forever. Well, there's a certain sense in which that's true, but it's a lot more than that because even unsaved people are going to live forever. Right? But well, they're going to live forever in the lake of fire. 
And that's not what, what he means when he says to give them eternal life. So what is, what is the essence of eternal life? He says, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And so eternal life, yes, it, it means that we're going to certainly live forever, but we're going to live forever in communion with divine persons, knowing the Father and knowing the Son and enjoying them forever throughout all eternity. That's what eternal, and that's why we could say, actually, I have eternal life now, right? Because I know the Father, and I know the Son, and I'm enjoying it. I don't have to wait till I die. Now, of course, when I die, I won't have a sin nature to deal with, and I'll probably enjoy it an awful lot more than I'm even enjoying right now, but I'm still enjoying it now. I have eternal life right now. And so do you. If, you're, if you've trusted the Savior as you're, uh, for, to, for the dealing with your sin on Calvary's cross, you've been brought into relationship with divine persons. And right now you're enjoying life eternal. Knowing thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So, <laughs> again, could we say this is another one of those lovely inferences of the equality of the father and the son knowing thee the only true god in jesus christ whom thou hast sent this is what eternal life is it's really coming into fellowship with divine persons the father and the son and of course paul would add in second corinthians 11 the communion of the holy ghost we're we're in fellowship with divine persons father son holy spirit now, verse 4, he says, or maybe I just say one more thing about verse 3 before we say something about verse 4. So salvation is not getting to know a theory or a formula. It is a living and personal relationship with real persons. <laughs> That's the most, most important thing. Uh, we, we want to introduce people to a real person, right? Not a formula. It's a person. It's a personal relationship with a son, the eternal son of God, and with the father who sent him that we can know through the son. <clears throat> and so he says in verse four, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now, here's a, a question. And the question is this. Is this statement anticipatory of calvary or is it to do with the training of the 12 because it seems as we go down this passage that basically he is reporting in to the father about his training of the disciples and so for instance he says in verse 12, while I was in them, in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gave me, I've kept and none of them is lost that the son of perdition, uh, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He, he talks about uh, verse 14, I have given them thy word. The world hated them because they are not of the world. Uh, he talks about the fact that they've kept his word. And so he's basically, he is, he is reporting in to the father about his training of the 12, preparing them. And I do believe that that is the work that's in view. Now, no question, in John 19, he's going to say, it is finished. <laughs> and the cross work of the Lord Jesus will be completed. But here, I believe what's in view is the, re the training of the 12. And so he says, I have glorified thee on the earth. What he's done is he has revealed the Father to these men. He, he has conveyed the truth to these men that he had been given. So look at back in John 1, verse, uh, John chapter 1, verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And that's what he'd done. He had declared the Father to these men. He had taught them about the Father. 
He had taught them uh, about the future. Uh, these men had paid attention. They had listened. Uh, they were trained. He had equipped them. Uh, they were ready now uh, for his departure. And so he says, I have glorified thee on the earth. Now, again, I'm not in any way taken away from that great statement in John 19, where he will cry, it is finished. But I think context would drive me here to the conclusion that this work that is in view is the training of the disciples, the ones that the father has given to the son. Because again, we, we see repeated over and over uh, this idea, those that you have given me. And so he says in verse five, and now, O father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. It tells us a number of things. It tells us that when the Lord Jesus came into this world, the glory that he had with the Father was veiled. You think of Wesley's great hymn, Veiled in Flesh, the Godhead See, Hail the Incarnate Deity. And the idea was that his glory was veiled here on earth. He took upon himself the form of a servant, right? That's what people saw, this servant. And so the glory was veiled. And it's a good job because the glory of the Lord Jesus had a blinding effect on human beings. <laughs> Saul of Tarsus hit the dust and was blinded when he saw the glorified Lord Jesus, right? So, so if he'd have come and his glory had to have been in an unveiled state, men would not have been able to handle it. They wouldn't have been able to get close. John, uh, as we've already seen uh, in this section, put his head on the bosom of the Lord Jesus. But when he saw the glorified Lord Jesus on the Isle of Patmos, he fell on his face like a dead man, right? And so the glory of the Lord Jesus was veiled. And the only time we got any kind of a glimpse of it was on Transfiguration Mount, where just for a few moments, as it were, he pulled the veil back and they got a little glimpse of the glory of the Son of God. But now he's asking the Father to glorify him with his own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Second thing we need to pull out of this marvelous verse is that the Lord Jesus as the eternal son, enjoyed a pre-existent glory with the father, right? There was, before he came into this world, he shared with the father this glory that he had. <clears throat> and so he says, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Before the world was created, before it came into being, the Lord Jesus, the eternal son, shared glory with the father throughout all the ages past, all eternity. And now he's praying and asking the father that that glory that had been veiled for these 33 years on earth would be restored to him. And we notice that at his ascension, this prayer was answered in full because as he's taken up into that glory cloud every time we see the lord jesus after his ascension we always see a glorified savior road to damascus we see it on patmos when he appears to john when he comes back to the earth every eye will see his glory right? He's coming back in his resplendent glory. And so what we could say is, um, sometimes I think in our minds, and it's, and it's natural that we think this way, but we still have this idea of Jesus as this lowly man of Galilee. But if he was to manifest himself in our midst, every one of us would hit the dust instantaneously. I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been in a fellowship. You, you, just like John, you would hit the dust 
because his glory would be so magnificent that the only fitting response is to get low in the presence of the glory of Christ. And so <clears throat> that prayer indeed would be answered. Some have suggested, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was, that it should literally say the glory that I had by thine own side. And it takes us back to John 1.1, 1, 1, where in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And the idea is face to face. There's this communion, the Father and the Son. So <clears throat> this is the Lord Jesus praying to his Father. And it's to do with glory. And we would ask that, Everything that's been said tonight would bring glory to his name. Amen.